Bible is full of stories that we all know and love. But how well do we know them? The answer might surprise you. The Bible you thought you knew is going to dive deep into the exquisite details of the biblical stories that make them fascinating and transforming. In last week's podcast, we presented part one of the Balaam story as narrated in Numbers chapters 22 through 24. This is part two. Last time we got as far as the incredible interchange between Balaam and his ass. We noted that she was more insightful than Balaam in that she was able to see the Lord's angel standing as an obstacle. Also, she was not only articulate, but quite a logician as well. In his exchange with her, Balaam ended up being bested by a creature that was formerly only his mode of transportation. We begin part two at that point in the story. Only with the Lord's help did Balaam finally see the angel of the Lord standing in his way. Ominously, the angel was sporting a sword. At this juncture, Balaam realized how poor both his eyesight and his insight had been. Instead of continuing his argument with the ass, he simply bowed, fell on his face, and worshipped. That's in verse 31 of chapter 22. Capturing his attention at last, The angel of the Lord had something to say to the formerly myopic expert at cursing and blessing. The angel wanted to know why Balaam's only response was to strike the animal. The angel went on to explain that Balaam's way had been blocked, something that even his ass was able to determine, because Balaam's way had been blocked been perceived as perverse. Though Balaam evidently thought he was being obedient, the angel discerned another motive. The angel continued by noting that the ass's actions had actually saved Balaam's ass. I'm sorry, I could not resist the pun given how delicious it is in the English language. The angel even made it clear that had she had not avoided confrontation, that is, that the the ass had not avoided confrontation, Balaam would have been dead while the ass would have still been alive. That's in verses 32 and 33 of chapter 22. This exchange prompted a confession on Balaam's part. Balaam allowed that, somehow, he had not seen the angel, something that was due more to, to, due to more than bad eyesight. Having admitted to this, he offered to go back home. That's in verse 34. The angel repeated that Balaam was to continue his journey only with the obligation to listen to the Lord. After this, Balaam accompanied the princes that King Balak had sent. That's in verse 35. Where these people representing King Balak were during Balaam's episode with his ass is never mentioned. In any case, once in, King's, once in King Balak's presence in Bamot Baal, the high place of Baal, Balaam instructed the king to build seven altars and supply him with seven bulls and seven rams. That's in verses 24, excuse me, verses 41 of chapter 22 and the first two verses of chapter 23. Balak did this, whereupon Balaam sacrificed each of the animals. It is not clear what the purpose of this sacrifice was. However, once the sacrifices were over, 
Balaam asked Balak to stand beside your burnt offering while he went to see whether the Lord would show up. Whatever God might say, Balaam promised to relay the contents to Balak. That's in verse 3. Sure enough, God came. Balaam informed God of the sacrifices, and God informed Balaam what he was supposed to say next. That's in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 23. When Balaam got back, the king and the princes were standing beside the burnt offering. At that point, Balaam was ready to speak. Presumably, since no one in the deputation or King, or king Balak knew about Balaam's inf- infamous interaction with his ass, everyone thought that Balaam was on the verge of cursing Israel. If that is what they thought, they were soon to be greatly disappointed. When Balaam begins his oracle, at first it merely describes why he was there in the first place. Here's what he says. From Aram, Balak has brought me, the king of Moab, from the eastern mountains. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. That's in verse 7. So far, so good, at least from King Balak's perspective. This first part of the oration simply rehearses why Balaam was hired by Balak. In the very next breath, however, Balaam dashes Balak's hope that a curse on Israel was on its way. Here's what he says. How can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? That's in verse 8. Balaam goes on, moving to a lament that Israel is all by itself, hardly counted among the nations. That's in verse 9. This status notwithstanding, Israel is growing exponentially, just as God had promised from the very outset. Concluding, Balaam notes that in light of the fact that Israel's growth is a sign of a divine promise being fulfilled, he would just as soon die as a righteous man. That's in verse 10. Of course, one does not get righteous by cursing God's elect people. As you might imagine, Balak is outraged. This is not why he had obtained Balaam's services. Though it was not explicit in his first oracle, this first oracle, Balak insists that instead of cursing Israel, Balaam has just blessed the people. That's in verse 11. Balaam responds not by defending himself, but by pointing out that he was obligated to follow the Lord's direction. That's in verse 12. King Balak will not give up so easily, though. He thinks another tactic may do the trick. He asks Balaam to go to another place, from which vantage point all the Israelites would not be visible. When Balaam sees only a smaller group of Israelites, he may find it more palatable to utter a curse. King Balak seems to have come up with the idea that Israel could be cursed in stages and with smaller groups. To put this plan into place, the king brought Balaam to the field of Zophim, to the top of Pisgah, and he built their seven altars thus repeating the sacrificial ritual. That's in verses 13 through 14 of chapter 23. Balaam did not protest the king's actions, but he did assert once again that he needed to consult with God. That's in verse 15. As before, God had specific instructions as to what Balaam would say. That's in verse 16. Balaam returned to Balak, who was still standing by the burnt offering along with his princes. 
The king was anxious to know what God had said this time, though Balak was delusional if he thought that God would all of a sudden turn on his own people. Balaam Balaam told Balak what God had said as he delivered his second oracle. This time, Balaam addresses Balak directly. That's in verse 18. This message singles out the Moabite king. The first point Balaam makes is that God is not a being who would make a promise and not fulfill it. In a word, God was not human, a creature who needs to repent or reneges on promises. That's in verse 19. Then Balaam reaffirms his charge. I received a command to bless. God has blessed, and I cannot revoke it. That's in verse 20. Balaam elaborates by noting that, relatively speaking, God has not had to witness misfortune or troubles in Israel. This is because the Lord is with Israel, who is better than any king. That's in verse 21. God brought them out of Egypt, thus converting an enslaved population into a wild ox with dangerous horns. For that reason alone, no enchantment or divination against Israel will ever work. That's in verse 23. In the end, when people view Israel, they will be amazed at what God has done for them. God has transformed Israel into a lioness on a successful hunt. That's in verse 24. Attempts to curse them would be quite dangerous for the curser. Admitting defeat at last, Balak tells Balaam he need not speak anymore. Don't worry about cursing or blessing. Our deal is off. That's in verse 25. But Balaam will not desist that easily. He reiterated what he had said to Balak previously, namely, that he was obligated to do and say as determined by the Lord. That's in verse 26. Preposterously, Balak tries again to get Balaam to curse Israel. It was as though he had not heard a thing. The king inexplicably thought that the sight from where the curse would come made a difference. So, Balak took Balaam to the top of Peor. Balaam says here, basically, you know the drill. Once again, seven altars are constructed and seven sacrificial bulls and rams were offered. That's in verses 29 and 30 of chapter 23. Everything is set up for a third oracle. By now, Balaam had learned his lesson. He no longer needed to consult the Lord, for the Lord had made it abundantly clear that Israel was to be blessed, period, full stop. Instead of consulting the Lord, Balaam set his face toward the wilderness as though to face Israel. This time around, and for the first time, the Spirit of God came upon him. That's in verses 1 and 2. of uh, 24. Balaam may not have been called a prophet in the narrative, but he is doing a credible imitation by now. Speaking with the Spirit of the Lord upon him, he begins his third oracle. Balaam now speaks as a prophet, invoking his own name, the oracle of Balaam ben Beor, the oracle of the man whose eye is perfect. That's verse 3. The comment about the improved eyesight is not lost on us. It was as though he could see as a prophet sees from the beginning. He continues in his vein. 
the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falling down but having his eyes uncovered. That's in verse 4. It is as though Balaam has entered into the realm of the great prophets. This oracle would have made proud an Amos, an Hosea, or an Isaiah. Balaam, as it were, is on a prophetic roll. Plus, from this oracle, no one could have guessed that he had failed to see three times an angel of the Lord standing in his way. Now he lauds Israel. How fair are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, encampments, O Israel, like valleys that stretch afar, like gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters, Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, that's an legendary king, and his kingdom shall be exalted, that's in verses 5 and 7. All these accolades are only possible for a blessed people. In other words, Israel shows all the marks of having been blessed and blessed richly. Balak's feeble efforts to undo Israel's status as blessed now are shown to be not only ineffectual, but foolhardy. This is a blessed people, and there's no stopping them. Balaam continues, God brings Israel out of Egypt. They have, as it were, the horns of the wild ox. They shall eat up the nations of their adversaries and shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them through with their arrows. That's in verse 8. Here Balaam rehearses the Magnalia Dei, the mighty acts of God. By the way, all of these verses are from uh, chapter uh, uh, 23. I was a little uh, confusing there. So here Balaam rehearses the Magnalia Dei, the mighty acts of God, including the rescue from Egypt where Israel was once enslaved. Not only that, but God transformed them from a whimpering slave population to a nation boasting its own power. With that sentiment, Balaam adds a nice postscript, echoing the promise God made to Abraham and Sarah at the very beginning of the Israelite story. First, Balaam repeats the feline image. Israel is like a lion or a lioness. That's in verse 9. Then, the final allusion to the promise to Abraham and Sarah. Blessed be everyone who blesses you, and cursed be everyone who curses you. After this consummate blessing that Balaam offers on Israel's behalf, it is hardly surprising that Balak is royally ticked off. His response to this third oracle and Balaam's counter-response will be dealt with in the final segment of the story next week. As I said last week, be sure to tune in for the final sequence, the third sequence in the story, fascinating story of Balaam. By now you're used to me telling you to go to my website and let me know what your email is, so that I can contact you when we're ready on for the uh, mini-courses, so you know the drill. Uh, also, if you have any questions you want me to address in a uh, future Q&A uh, session, ask me my question with fspina106 at gmail.com. I want to thank you so very much for listening to The Bible You Thought You Knew. I have a question for you. 
Do you have a question or topic that you'd like me to cover on the podcast? If so, all you need to do is head over to Apple Podcasts and do two simple things. One, leave a rating and review telling me what you think of the podcast. Two, in that review, ask anything you want related to the Bible. That's all you have to do. Then, listen in to hear your question answered on a future episode. Join us next time on The Bible You Thought You Knew when we discuss Jesus' personal Bible. God bless.